Thank you very much. Uh, the Diocese of Kitgum Children Ministry, thank you very much for leading us in worship and in reading for us the scripture of the day. And thank you, Reverend God and Reverend Lydia, coordinating us very well. And the rest of the leadership team, we thank you very much for bringing us this inspirational lunch hour. I'd like to appreciate our for organizing this opportunity and form your worship together and hear the word of the Lord together. And today we are privileged to start the week with this theme, like the world, and particularly the topic, the prophecy of miracle. I would like us to pray together as we listen to God's word. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you because your word is light. And as we talk about lighting the world, we know that your word is the agent that we need to light up our world. So may you speak to us and open our eyes and ears and all our senses that we may receive what you have in store for us this afternoon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I would like us to start off by, yes, I can see some amen. It seems my voice is clearly being heard. I'd like us to start off by attesting and saying uh, something about the schools we went to. As I saw this theme and topic, I remembered many schools whose motto is uh, education is light. Did you go to that school? You can type the name of that school or just say, yes, I went to that school. Uh, education is light, knowledge is light. Some mottos are knowledge is light, uh, education is light. If you went to such a school, please just type it in the chat. We will know that uh, you sang that motto for a long time during the time you were in either that primary school or secondary school uh, when you had that motto, knowledge is light, education is light. Uh, yes, that, that is actually true because uh, many times uh, we have even called ignorance, darkness. Ignorance is like being in the dark when somebody doesn't know something, they say we are in the dark. Uh, even when um, yeah, education is power, somebody went to a school with that motto. Yeah, some people will, 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 will complain. Why have you not told me about this and about the other? I am in the darkness about this to mean I don't know about this. So yes, knowledge is light. Education is light. Those who have gone to school, we sometimes call them the enlightened, the people who have seen the light. And those who have not gone to school or we consider have not gone to school enough, we will think they are in the darkness. They are still in a dark world. Villages where schools are not enough or schools are rare will be called backward or in the dark. And where knowledge is much more common, those will be called to be enlightened. And uh, those are the ways we have interacted with uh, education. We have interacted with uh, knowledge and this week, we are looking at light the world, and particularly today, the prophecy of miracle. We've had our reading taken from Luke chapter 1, verse 5 to 15, and I want to dwell on that as we look at this topic of the prophecy of miracle. Now, in this verse, in these verses, in this passage, we encounter a couple that is going through an interesting time, an interesting season of their life. And uh, this is uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth. They live in the days of Herod. And the days of Herod are good for us to remember in this season of Advent as we head to Christmas. It was during these days that Jesus Christ was born, but before Jesus was born, uh, these are the days in which John the Baptist 
was born. Today we see him prophesied. These are the days in which these two big figures were born, the days of Herod, Herod the Great, Herod the Great, who was ruler by ruler within the Palestinian region, the Israel region, and he was ruler on behalf of uh, Rome, on behalf of the emperor of Rome. He had been made king of the Jews. And that is the season in which the Jews themselves long for a king who has not been appointed by Rome because Rome was oppressive. Rome was not favorable as their power, the power over them. They wanted a king of their own a king appointed by God, a king that was like David. They longed for such a king because the regime was not a good one, was not a nice one to be uh, with. So Herod, although he was a Jew, was not really fancied. He was not loved as, as the rightful king. So the Jews looked forward to the rightful king, the Messiah that will come and rule justly and restore their superpower status. When David reigned, Israel was a superpower. So they longed to, to their liberation, their consolation. In those days of King Herod, I must not only point to the oppressive regime, the, I would say, illegitimate regime, if you're speaking uh, in terms of where, was it the rightful regime in place? According to the Jews, it was illegitimate. It was not the rightful way they should be governed. I should not only talk about that, but also talk about the corruption, the corrupt officials, especially the Jews who were employed by Rome to collect taxes. Those were so corrupt and they ate from the corruption. And, and yet they were not just corrupt, but they really came out as traitors. Traitors. The king himself, King Herod, was looked at as a traitor, working for the enemy, working for the Jews, sorry, working for the Romans, working for the enemy of the Jews. And so these other officials who went in to collect taxes and to take responsibility for different areas of governance were looked at as traitors, and they made matters worse by being corrupt and eating from their own brothers and sisters corruption or oh, no. So the Jews were not in good days. When we talk about the days of Herod, those were not good days. And uh, even in our days today, we are able to see what days uh, I and mean, what similarities these days have with the days of Herod. We are talking about uh, 6 BC, thereabout, 6 BC, the days of Herod. He is believed to have died around 4 BC. So around 6 BC is what we are talking about in this time. But we look at the characteristics of those days, and we see that even these days today, we have such characteristics. When we talk about oppressive regimes, oppressive governance, and uh, people being traitors, people working like traitors, that is not uncommon today. People elect a person and they believe this person will really be great and favor the poor and look after them well, but they turn out to be another problem. They oppress the poor, they oppress their own, and it's not good. The people hope to vote them out next time only for the returnee campaigner to come with a lot of money and buy their way into power. Those are the days in which we live. We also live in the days when corruption has become institutionalized and corruption has also been baptized the names of institutions as big as nations. Uh, it's not uncommon today for us who are in Uganda, some of you who are in other countries, I don't know, but uh, there is a talk of this is Uganda. You go to an office and as the officer there is soliciting a bribe, uh, he says, this is, you know Uganda, you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes the bribe in form of, is in the form of money or sometimes for the ladies, the bribe in form of uh, uh, sex, 
just to, to solicit something to, to engage in an unholy, uncalled for, uncouth activity for the sake of getting what you deserve, a service that you deserve very well. And that is very unfortunate, the corruption today, which is a, a reminder that we have been in the days of Herod before, but these days may not be so different from the days of Herod. That is the time in which this couple lived, Zechariah and Elizabeth. And Zechariah and Elizabeth are a couple that has a very ironical combination. I will talk about the ironical combination in this couple to paint to us how bad things were for them. Not only were they living in an environment, the days of Herod, but also this couple is uh, really unprivileged, very unfortunate, if I may put it that way, that they have problems, although they have a good background. That's why I call it an ironical combination. The introduction we have of this couple is that Zechariah is a priest and his wife Elizabeth is the descendant of Aaron. She is a descendant of Aaron, which means that both the man and the wife are descendants of the priestly family. They are both descendants of the priestly family. And the good thing is that both are righteous. Oh, how good. Both are righteous. There are times when you have a couple with good background. One is righteous, one is not. But in this case, both are righteous. That is such a great thing especially I am a pastor's child. My dad is the Reverend Geoffrey Tivenda of Bunyoro Kitara Diocese. And unfortunately we have had the problems sometimes of having the children of pastors becoming on, going on the other side and being so evil and so wicked. Thank God for a number of us who God has saved even when we are children of pastors, those who go astray and go really bad they cause shame and scorn upon their families and upon the name of the Lord. But we thank God that he has redeemed many still. And as long as one is still alive, you are a pastor's child. You are never lost forever. You have not been cast. The devil may have attacked you mainly because you're a pastor's child. But you can win the victory and you can get saved. You can be redeemed. These, Zechariah and uh, Elizabeth, who were descendants of priests, were not wicked. They were not like the descendants of uh, a priest called Eli in the Bible. The sons were wicked people. These, Zechariah and Elizabeth, are holy people, righteous, both of them righteous before God. And the Bible says they were walking in all the commandments. I love that verse where they are not walking in some of the commandments, uh-huh. They're not walking in almost all of the commandments. They are walking in all the commandments. What a privilege to have such a description made upon somebody. Now, many of us may think ah, perfection is impossible, but perfection is possible. Many a time we want to rate our own uh, perfection by our own standards, but before God, God can impute perfection upon you. You just trust the Lord and do your best. And the Lord gives you the grace to be perfect, to be righteous, to walk in all the commandments. That's what is the description of Zechariah and his wife, Elizabeth. Zechariah was a serving priest, serving the Lord, serving the Lord, serving the Lord. And he was a prayerful man. He prayed regularly. And we will see shortly how God answers his prayers. He prayed regularly. They prayed. And I believe they not only prayed for themselves as a family because of their national duty, because of their community duty, they also prayed for the nation of Israel. They prayed for their brothers and sisters and prayed for the nation of Israel. Even when things were hard, I want to encourage us. Things may be hard. Things may, the, the regime may be uh, oppressive in some areas. The, the, the corruption may be in different offices and some of the unsuspecting offices. But to remain righteous, to remain prayerful, 
to walk in all the commandments of God is still possible, and God calls us to exactly that. Now we have examples. Today, in this reading, we have examples in Zechariah and Elizabeth, children of Kitgum and children everywhere. Please listen to this very carefully. Zechariah is a good example. Elizabeth is a good example. When I grow up, I want to be like them so that I'm described as righteous, as working in all the commandments of God. Yes, even you, when you grow up, you should be described like this. Nothing should hinder you. Nothing should distract you. It is possible God can give you the grace not to be like the other corrupt people, like those who oppress others, but to be righteous and to walk in all the commandments of God. Yes, I may ask you later, what examples do we have that we can actually do this? And you should tell me about Zechariah and Elizabeth because we read about them as righteous, walking in all the commandments of the Lord, serving the Lord. Zechariah is now on duty and also very prayerful people. Sometimes you may ask yourself questions when you find an ironical combination. This couple, although we have looked at their good side, their happy side, their favorable side, there is another side. The Bible says, but, this is verse seven, but they had no child. Oh, how unfortunate. They had no child. Some problem was in the house. They had no children. Elizabeth was barren. That's what we read. And unfortunately, it was time up. They were already advanced in years. What an ironical combination. If people have a good background, a priestly background, they are righteous. They're walking in all the commandments of God. Why is it that they now have this problem? This shame, this scorn, this risk of not having a child among the people of Israel. It was so dangerous and risky not to have a child. It was shameful. The men would really feel bad about having no children because it means that when you die, your name is forgotten. Your name is forgotten. So it was a tough place to be for the couple to be without a child. In Africa, it's not easy either, for when you don't have a child, you may get some proposals from the elders. Why don't you try this? Why don't you try the other? Oh, that is a problem. And some have actually followed those proposals. Some have followed them, like Abraham did, following the proposal of his wife, Sarah, and went into Hagar. Some of them have followed such proposals, and Abraham reaped a lot of pain from that relationship with Hagar. So it is even today. Many men think it's a wise thing to go somewhere else and look for a child, perhaps another woman, perhaps a witch doctor. Uh, but, but then they reap a lot of pain out of that. We are asking ourselves, why such a combination? A people who are righteous and good, yet God has denied them. God has not favored them with a child. Today we thank God for medical uh, solutions, uh, fertility solutions. Then they were not there. So Zechariah and Elizabeth did not have the privilege of in vitro fertilization. They didn't have the privilege of all these technologies that are coming up, being researched, and sometimes being used, and sometimes they work. So Zechariah and Elizabeth have this unfortunate uh, st status of being childless. I don't know whether you also have some questions, you have done your best, or somebody in your neighborhood, somebody you know, deserves better from the Lord. Honestly, they deserve better. But they have this ironical combination, and they have this unprivileged status of being childless. It may not just be lack of a child, it may be lack of something else which is valuable, treasurable in our situation. And you are asking why? You are asking yourself why? Why did the parents get abducted? 
Why does this child suffer from HIV and AIDS when he's innocent? There are many questions of why, why such an ironical combination. You find a talented young man, a talented young lady, but they have a challenge somewhere. They are lacking a critical element in their lives. And we ask why, why you may be listening to this. And my answer to you may not necessarily satisfy and exhaust this question, but it is something that we should take to heart seriously. The Lord knows. The Lord knows. We will shortly see how he comes to talk to Zechariah. The Lord surely knows. And when he comes to talk to Zechariah, the angel comes bringing word from the Lord and says, prayer has been heard. Your prayers have been heard. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God may have delayed to answer the prayers, but finally your prayers have been heard. The Lord knows. Don't give up. Don't stop living before the Lord in righteousness. The Lord knows. And I would imagine, uh, just like the comment from Adam Clark uh, tells us that this man, Zechariah, must have been praying about many things, particularly prominently regarding a son, regarding a child, frequently praying for a son, for a child, personal prayer, family, personal prayer. But the other element must have been the days of Herod, praying for the consolation of Israel, praying for the deliverance of Israel from this oppressive regime, praying for the coming of the Messiah. This is a community prayer. This is a national prayer. God helps us to pray, but we should pray both for personal needs, family needs, and also pray for the national needs, for the needs of the country, for the needs of our world. God invites us to be in prayer on both fronts. And uh, just like Zechariah shows us, yes, we need to pray for both fronts. And when the angel comes, Zechariah's answers are both here. Zechariah is answered in both dimensions. A son is prophesied on the other, on one hand, and on the other hand, consolation for Israel is also prophesied, joy and gladness, joy and gladness. We read that towards the end of that text that we saw from verse 13 to 15. A son is prophesied, and then we hear, you will have joy and gladness. This is national consolation. Don't give up. Don't stop living before the Lord. The Lord knows. Advanced in years, Zechariah could have given up, but don't give up. Trust in the Lord. Wait patiently on him. Keep hope alive. As I draw to the close of this sharing, friends, I'd like to talk about prophecy and the miracle, the prophecy of miracle. The prophecy, the prophecy points us to God's word, to what God is saying. And I told you that education is light, knowledge is light. The knowledge from what God is saying is very, very enlightening. Zechariah must have been enlightened by this word and said, wow, I've been praying all this long, not knowing what is happening. God knows, God hears, hallelujah. This is now encouraging. Talking about miracles, we have academicians, powerful people who discredit miracles. They think miracles cannot happen. I read a book by a man called Larry Shapiro. He is a man that fights apologetics. He is a man that uh, rebuttals uh, uh, things of God. And in his book, uh, in this particular book, uh, he has written about why it is unreasonable and unjustified to believe in miracles. Uh, I, I like his conclusion, but let me first tell you what the book is about. The book, the, the title is The Miracle Myth, Why Belief in the Resurrection and the Supernatural is Unjustified. And he makes two arguments as to why belief in miracles is unjustified, uh, at least to the scientific standards of modern historians and philosophers. And he says, miracles in ancient times are 
Uh, they, they were like commanding seas to part and raising bodies from the dead, water suddenly turning into wine. He says, oh, these people believe in them. People say, yes, they happened. However, there is a big challenge. And he says that uh, no one has ever heard or currently has good reasons for believing in miracles, mainly because the sources where we get these things from are untrustworthy. He says the people who wrote may not have been trustworthy because they were biased. He also says the people who transmitted, those who wrote the copies from which we read today may have had errors in their writing. So he goes on to advance reasons why we should not believe in miracles. But I love the way he concludes. Shapiro concludes by saying that belief in miracles cannot be justified. Yet, this does not necessarily disprove the possibility of miracles. In other words, in his conclusion, he's only saying, we may not be able to prove and uh, justify belief in miracles. However, this does not necessarily disprove the possibility of those miracles. They could have happened. I want believers to be careful as we listen to philosophers and know that God performs miracles. Earlier on, I read a book which was talking about uh, health issues in Africa and uh, education issues in Africa. One of the writers uh, uh, was talking about education and how God needs to intervene in education. Of course, there are many education innovators who are trying to cover the gap in education. And one of the statements I read was how currently there is a projected global shortage of 18 million teachers over the next decade. India needs another 1.2 million. America needs 2.3 million. Sub-Saharan Africa needs a miracle. And then when I read that, now I look back and remember how COVID-19 was talked about as so devastating. And I can look back and say, God performed a miracle in Africa. But when COVID-19 arrived, contrary to what those people who prophesied and said, oh, it will finish all the Africans, or it will be worse than anywhere else in the world, God performs a miracle. He is the great physician and he protects. Yes, it has been tough, but when you look at what those educationists and those health practitioners prophesied, we have been saved. We have been saved indeed. We have not suffered as much as it had been predicted. God performs miracles globally. God performs miracles locally. There are couples we have prayed with who were like Zechariah, maybe not as advanced in years as them, but they have received children. We thank God because we should trust in him. We should wait patiently on him and keep hope alive and never give up. Friends, this is the gist of our reading today, the prophecy of miracle. We are privileged to read about this prophecy now when already John the Baptist was born and lived and ministered and pointed to Jesus Christ. It would have been much harder for those who heard the prophecy then, but today we read it when it had already been fulfilled. And we are encouraged to trust in the Lord, to wait patiently on him and keep hope alive. He will speak, he will deliver. He may delay, but he will speak, he will deliver. We need to keep hopeful. This Advent season encourages us to keep hopeful. And I pray that God will help us to keep our eyes on him. The combination may be ironical, but God still is on the throne. Cast down to him your cares. Don't give up on prayer. Luke 18, there is a parable which says we should pray and never lose heart. Zechariah exemplifies exactly that in his advanced age. Praying and never losing heart. I don't know in what way God will answer you. One thing I know is that he knows. One thing I know is that he is aware of your situation. And may the light of his word May the light of the word of God, may the, may the light of prophecy, prophecy both means what may be told for the future and what is 
being told now what God is saying now. May that light continue to light your world and light your way and keep you hopeful and keep you encouraged in the name of God, the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. May God bless you.